So I want to talk to you a little bit about institutional corruption. Uh, and let me explain institutional corruption uh, by telling you a little bit about what it is, actually by starting by telling you a little bit about what I don't mean it is. So by institutional corruption, I don't mean the sort of thing that this man, Mr. Blagojevich, inspires in us. I'm not talking about activities we could think about as bribery, what Blagojevich called, quote, just politics. <laughs> Indeed, I'm not talking about any violation of existing rules. By institutional corruption, what I mean is a certain kind of influence within what we could think of as an economy of influence, and an influence that has a certain effect. It is institutional corruption, in the way that I mean it, if it weakens the effectiveness of the institution, if that influence weakens the effectiveness and especially if it weakens the public trust that an institution enjoys. That's what I mean by institutional corruption. Okay, so then what would an example be? Well, let's start with what many would think of as an easy case, this institution. There's an extraordinary book by a man, uh, Robert Kaiser, from Washington Post, which tells the story of how this institution has pretty radically changed in just the past 20 years. And at the core of the change that he describes is a change in the practice of lobbying, developing what he describes as a kind of economy inside of Washington, which is more perfect today than at any time in the history of the United States, an economy for delivering public policy to those who pay. So the economy, as he describes it, has lobbyists, of course, at its core, who in a certain sense pay members, and members who in a certain sense pay interests, and interests who in a certain sense pay the lobbyists. Each pays the other. In this sense, each is dependent upon the other. So let's break this down. Lobbyists paying members. He describes how lobbyists, in a sense, pay members both during their time as a member of Congress and after they are a member of Congress. So during their time, lobbyists pay with cash, and I don't mean you know brown paper bag cash, but instead support for political campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has gone through the roof, members become increasingly dependent upon a regular source for the income they need to run those campaigns. People who spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back into Congress increasingly look at these lobbyists as suppliers, maybe less uh, generously as pushers inside of this institution and dependency relationship. Kaiser says this is something new, as he writes, Money has been part of American politics forever. On occasion in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. But the scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal channels today. They need more, they take much more, and in that sense, the lobbyists pay during the life of a member's tenure. But they also pay after a member has had tenure. Lobbyists pay, in a certain sense, with futures, right? So my friend Jim Cooper, graduate of this law school, um, described to me how he has seen Congress change, as he says, Congress has become a kind of farm league for K Street. So increasingly, members and staffers and bureaucrats on the Hill think of a business model. And their business model is focused on life after government, so life as the lobbyist. So 50% of senators between 1998 and 2004 graduated and became lobbyists, 42% of the member of the House. And you see this kind of business model familiar to a law professor, right? So they go into a practice where they make about $180,000 a year for about six or eight years, and then they want to become partners by becoming lobbyists. So their junior practice time is as a congressperson, and then they become members of the lobbying partnership, and they get paid real money. That's the 
pattern which he describes. And so that means increasingly everybody inside the system depends upon the system surviving, depends upon it staying the same way it is now into the future so that they have a future to move on to. In that sense, both during and after, he says, the lobbyists are paying members. Then members are paying interests, right? So right now we see this happening in spades. Uh, Mr. Uh, Max Baucus, of course, a man who represents 0.3% of the American population, is the most powerful man in the context of the uh, decisions around public health. Um, he has opened his coffers and collected more than $4 million in contributions from interests affected by the legislation he is directly controlling, because that's the norm today. I am in power. I leverage that power to raise money for me and my colleagues who need to get back to office. And then sometimes extraordinarily brazen, uh, there's a story that just broke this week about uh, this man, John Campbell, a congressman from California, a man who is a landlord to six used car dealers from whom he collects between $600,000 and $6 million in rent every year, a man who received $170,000 from uh, uh, used car dealers in campaign contributions. On Wednesday, he introduced an amendment to this bill. This is the Consumer Financial Protection Agency Act, an amendment which, after he received $170,000 in contributions and is a landlord to these great tenants, exempted used car dealers from any of the regulations that might have anything to do with consumer protection. So in this sense, the policy gets bent to those who pay. And then in an extraordinary study published in Kansas just earlier in this year, out calculating the return on investment from one such little escapade by lobbyists, discovered the return on investment for this particular statute for lobbyists was 22,000%. And as you think as business people, and I'm sure many of you uh, think this way all the time, between investments that might return 22,000% or trying to invent a better widget, you can understand why an extraordinary, significantly important chunk of investment resources get shifted towards Washington. In that sense, what members pay interest? And then the interests pay the lobbyists, again, Kaiser. In earlier generations, enterprising young men came to Washington looking for power and political adventure, often with ambitions to save or reform the country or the world. In the last fourth of the 20th century, such aspirations were supplanted by another familiar American yearning to get rich. So this industry, which he describes, has uh, grown to about a nine to $12 billion industry, offers extraordinary return. This one lobbyist here, the man who is uh, credited um, with creating the way earmarks now function, is now a man worth $100 million because of the money he has made through this enterprise. So Kaiser says, what we've got here is an economy, each feeding each other. And the thing to recognize is that this economy has an effect. Number one, in the sense that I described institutional corruption, plausibly it weakens the effectiveness of the institution, in the sense that it bends the policies of the institution. Now, of course, the politicians say that's ridiculous. Of course, the money doesn't actually affect what they do. But I find this, you know, a little bit hard to believe, at least if you want to be charitable in interpreting what they do, right? Because think about easy cases, which the government needs to consider. The kind of two plus two equals four cases, which the government gets fundamentally wrong. So when I was here at the Berkman Center, I started work in an area that became my life's work for about uh, 12 years, um, uh, focusing on copyright. That work began here at the Berkman Center on uh, October 27, 1998, when Congress passed a statute in honor of this great American, Sonny Bono. Um, this was the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Now, the question a public policymaker should ask is, does it make sense to extend the term of an existing copyright by 20 years? And you answer that question by asking the question, what's a copyright for? And a copyright is for the purpose of creating an incentive. 
And what we know about this world, or at least a world that doesn't yet have the technologies of Star Trek, is that incentives are prospective. So no matter what the United States Congress does, George Gershwin is not going to produce anything more. So if you ask the question, does this advance the public good to extend the term of existing copyright, it's an easy answer. Indeed, when we challenge this statute in the Supreme Court, this liberal economist, oh wait, that's Milton Friedman, right-wing Nobel Prize winning economist, said he would join our brief only if the word no-brainer was somewhere in <laughs> the brief. But obviously there were no brains in this place when that statute was passed. So here's an easy public policy question Congress just gets wrong. Or think about an area I've become increasingly interested in, nutrition. There's a consensus among those who know something about this that we eat way too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. In 2003, the World Health Organization thought that they would try to advance progress on the basis of the consensus. They promulgated a standard that said no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry, they have this sweet little logo here. They went ballistic. There they are, going ballistic. <laughs> they got the United States Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO unless the WHO backed down from their ridiculous suggestion that 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from sugar. Instead, they wanted 25% of your daily caloric intake to come from added sugar. Now, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board promulgated standards that suggested 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. That's a balanced diet according to our government. So you can start with Fruit Loops or M&Ms for breakfast, a glass of milk, a cheeseburger for lunch, pepperoni pizza, indeed three slices of pepperoni pizza, and of course sugar cookies for dessert. That's a balanced diet according to our government. Now of course, once again, here's an easy public policy question that the government gets wrong, maybe most profoundly in the context uh, of global warming. Of course, we all recognize there's a consensus, consensus that we're doing it. As Al Gore described the consensus, the debate's over. Five points in the consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. They wanted to study how thick this consensus actually was in the scientific community. So they did a random selection of 1,000 peer-reviewed journal articles between 1993 and 2003. They found that 0%, exactly 0 of those articles, questioned that consensus. Then they did a study of an equivalent range in 1988 to 2002 of popular media articles. They found that 53% of those articles questioned that consensus, a product of the extraordinary amount of junk science that had been fueled into this debate, giving politicians the excuse they needed to delay at least by 10 years. I thought it would be over now, but still continuing that delay and addressing this, the most important public policy question perhaps the world faces. So once again, an easy question the government gets wrong. Now, the point to recognize here with these easy questions is that the government either gets these wrong because they're idiots or because they're being guided by something other than reason in these cases. My view might be controversial is they are not idiots here. It's not stupidity that's causing these easy cases to be so fundamentally skewed. And the terrifying point to recognize is that government doesn't just confront easy cases. It's not just the easy cases they get wrong. It's a wide range of cases they systematically get wrong because of the skewing produced by the economy of influence that Kaiser is describing. Now that skewing also produces a weakening of public trust in this institution. So this is an institution which right now enjoys about a 22% popularity rating, I mean a public approval rating. The British enjoyed a higher approval rating at the time of the revolution than the Congress does today. <laughs> California, 88% of people believe, on the basis of what they've seen in Congress, that money buys results in Congress, leading to this extraordinary cynicism and disengagement that cynicism produces with the work of this institution. Now, 
Those two parts together, skewing the results and changing public trust, uh, are what I think of as the paradigm of this institutional corruption uh, 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 problem. Okay, so are there other examples? Well, there are plenty alleged. For example, in the context of medicine, think about pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical um, drugs, of course, huge part of the uh, uh, nation's economy. In 2005, $200 billion spent on prescription drugs, five times the amount spent in 1990. In 2000, about $15.7 billion was being spent on promoting those drugs. About $5 billion of that was being spent on a process called detailing, which is basically sending people out to doctors and getting doctors to buy certain kinds of drugs by giving them samples and, until recently, gifts. As one detailer described it, the essence of pharmaceutical gifting is bribes that aren't considered bribes. And then a little more detail, while it's the doctor's job to treat patients and not to justify their actions, it's my job to constantly sway the doctors. It's a job I am paid and trained to do. Doctors are neither trained nor paid to negotiate. Most of the time, they don't even realize that's what they are doing. So the claim is there's a series of complex relationships here that are changing the results of prescribing uh, behavior in ways that's not consistent with the underlying objective of medicine. And it raises a question whether these claims are true. And more fundamentally, what would it take for us to know whether the claims are true? We're thinking in the context of agencies. Uh, obviously, regulators, as you learned here, um, often have to de develop rules on the basis of their view of the facts. And a fundamental question in the process of lawmaking is how do we protect fact-finding? Supreme Court entered this debate last year in a very interesting ruling, Exxon Shipping versus Baker. This was a case thinking about punitive damages in the context of admiralty. And in the course of the opinion, footnote 17, Justice Souter said this, the court is aware of a body of literature running parallel to anecdotal reports examining the predictability of punitive awards by conducting numerous mock juries with different jurors are confronted with the same hypothetical case. Because this research was funded in part by Exxon, however, we decline to rely upon it. So the principle is, funded in part by the interest being regulated means the evidence is excluded, not considered by the relevant regulator here at the Supreme Court. Now, you might look at that and think, well, that's admirable. Or if you practice administrative law, you might look at it and think, it's a little bit precious. Because, of course, agencies rely upon studies funded in part by the industries regulated all the time. That's how regulation happens. So, for example, think about the history of the regulation of uh, hexavalent chromium oxide, which you know by the name chromium-6. Um, chromium-6, which was uh, uh, predominant in, in chrome plating factories, um, used to invite workers to play this thing called a, they called the dime game. The dime game was when a new worker came in, an older worker would take a dime and pass it from one side of his nostrils to the other because a hole had developed between the two because of the chemicals that he was exposed to while working in this factory. That led some people to believe maybe there was a problem with these chemicals. Um, OSHA investigated. 1976, OSHA concluded a comprehensive occupational health standard is urgently needed, emphasis in the original, to protect employees. They promised to complete it in the shortest possible time. That was 1976. Regulation was promulgated in 2006. The 30-year delay was caused directly because of studies funded in part by the industries regulated that tried to demonstrate that, in fact, this, what is now recognized to be cancer-causing agent, was not causing any harm at all. And obviously, it's not just here. It raises a question in all of these contexts of administrative rulemaking whether the structure of fact-finding here has, corrupt, has been corrupted in this process. And more fundamentally, what would it take to say that it was? What would you have to know? Finally, think about jur journalism. There's a great book that's coming out in the spring called The Death and Life of American Journalism, talking about this extraordinary public policy problem we have, which is that journalism is deeply threatened by new technologies. So typically, we think about it as a product of the internet or this guy, Craig Newmark, who started Craigslist. Um, we blame those two creatures. And, and those two creatures are, in a real way, responsible for a big part of the decline. 
But as McChesney and Nichols demonstrate, the real decline in American journalism happens long before the internet is even out there. Right? The big change, as they say, come in the late 70s and 1980s when large corporate change accelerated the long-term trend to gobble up daily newspapers. And the thesis they advance, I just put it out there, is that the change then is tied to the structure of ownership in these journalistic contexts. So when locally based family owned newspapers were consolidated into publicly owned newspaper chains, an essential trust between journalism and the community served was betrayed and that was the first step down the line of radically changing the character of journalism. So notice here, he's point, they're pointing to a type of ownership that corrupted the institution. And so in the way that I frame it, it's an influence within an economy of influences that weakens the effectiveness and weakens the public trust of this institution. And once again, the question is, what would it take to actually know whether that's true of journalism? Now, in each of these cases, I want to say the institutional corruption is plausible. They each fit the form. But we need more than intuitions to answer the question whether, in fact, there is the kind of corruption I've described in each of these cases. We need a framework within which to understand it, a metric, in a sense, to know. Each of us has our own ideological commitments in these cases, but what we need here is a way to escape our own ideological commitment, to find a framework that gives us confidence about the judgment we draw about these important public institutions. And that is the aim of the project which I've been brought back here to Harvard to my great pleasure to help lead, a project that is uh, housed at this university center, the Safra Foundation Center, um, in a portion of this place we're going to call the lab. The lab will build this neutral ground to build a framework within which to know whether and when institutional corruption in the sense that I've described it exists. And then once we can identify it to develop remedies, structural remedies that might help address the institutional corruption when we can say that it exists. Um, so why? Or more precisely, why now? <clears throat> My wife asks this all the time as she thinks about the beautiful weather in California that we have left. Um, and I want to answer that question in closing this afternoon by framing it in terms of thinking about responsibility. And I want to think about responsibility in the context of a story all of you are very familiar with, a story that begins with this event on March 24th, 1989, when this ship under the command of Joseph Hazelwood ran aground, spilling about 11 million gallons of oil into Prince William Sound. This is Captain Hazelwood on the radio immediately after this happens. As you might wonder, listening to that, there was an immediate question raised about uh, Mr. Hazelwood. Namely, was he in the full command of his capacity as he was captaining this ship? There was a suggestion that he was drunk. And there was a lot of doubt raised about that question. He said he only had four vodkas before he got on the ship. Um, <laughs> The, uh, legal, the blood alcohol test suggested that it must have been six times the legal limit when he got on the ship. But he denied that, and there was a big fight about whether, in fact, it was true. So there might be a doubt about whether he was drunk when he captained this super tanker. But what there's no doubt about is that everybody knew Hazelwood was a chronic alcoholic. Indeed, his mother testified that he knew he had a problem with alcohol in the past. 1985, Exxon, in fact, treated him for this trouble. After the accident, the president said he thought that he had mastered the problem. Exxon hadn't learned that in 1986, his license had been revoked because he was driving under the influence. 
And in 1988, his license had been revoked because he was driving under the influence. Indeed, while he was driving the super tanker through Prince William Sound, he was not qualified to drive a VW Beetle in his home state because his license had been suspended. Now, forget for a second Hazelwood. Forget him. I want you to think a little bit about those around him, the other officers who knew this about him, who could have just picked up a phone. So while a drunk was driving a super tanker, think about the people who did nothing about it. What should we think about them? Because when I think about this problem of institutional corruption, I I ask the question about institutional corruption because I increasingly worry that we are these sailors. We have critical problems as a nation, requiring serious attention. But I fear we don't have institutions capable of that attention. They are distracted, unable to focus on fundamental questions because their attention is drawn elsewhere like on an aircraft going through a thunderstorm watching the pilot flirt with a flight attendant, or a surgeon calling to confirm tea time in the middle of surgery, or half of you on your cell phone as you're driving down the highway. The point is there are critical problems here requiring serious attention, and none of these essential institutions have developed themselves to devote the attention necessary to answering those questions. When you notice that, have to ask the question, who's to blame for that? Who is responsible? And my view is, it's not enough to hold the Blagojeviches of the world responsible. They're not the only, or indeed the most important person responsible here. Instead, it's good people. It's decent people. Decent people who simply don't pick up the phone. It is us, we, who in this context should be doing something about these institutions. We, the most privileged, who have the obligation to step up to fix it. Because the most outrageous part is that in all of these contexts, the corruptions here are primed by the most privileged in our society, yet permitted by the passivity of the most privileged as well. That's the focus of our study. And I'm eager to take questions or abuse as you decide to hand it out. Thank you very much.